Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, today, I will be uh, telling you about how I managed not to write a whole bunch of code. Because the best code is the code we didn't write, right? Okay. So, uh, my name is Valentine. Um, I'm a pretty active member in the French uh, community. I organize uh, my local uh, Scala user group. I uh, participate to the Scala IO conference that will be taking place uh, late October in Lyon, in France, of course. And before we begin, uh, I have to warn you, um, I have a whole bunch of uh, slides to, to show you. So um, I don't have the time for uh, funny pictures. And more importantly, um, there will be quite a lot of code uh, that probably doesn't compile because I wrote it by head and didn't use the, the compiler. Uh, and it might look a little scary, but uh, bear with me, it all hopefully makes sense in the end. So, uh, this is a story of a, a real project I worked on uh, a few months ago uh, with, uh, with a team. Um, the project was to build a, a data platform for a fairly big French company. Uh, that company uh, has uh, roughly 100 uh, branches. And the idea was to gather all the data for all from all the branches on a single platform and then make uh, processing of it. Each branch had roughly 100 tables or streams or data structures. So that sums up to roughly 10,000 uh, data structures. And obviously, um, it's it's a, a quite a bit of a challenge. We we started from from scratch, uh, and we had six months to to get in, into production, and we were a small team of developers, like five or six developers. Um, to add a little bit uh, of difficulty, um, the the data would come, uh, of course, in big batches, big files uh, with JSON data and so on, and by streams, like in Kafka topics. And we had to implement what uh, is called uh, privacy by design, which is basically um, the source tells us um, what fields uh, contain uh, personal data, and we had to uh, encrypt this data or apply some uh, treatment so that the, the privacy of people is protected. And of course, it's a big company, it has many organizational problems, and we knew that um, the, the sources wouldn't be ready on, on day one to, to give us their data. So we had to be able to, to manage uh, enrol enrollments of data sources uh, across time. So basically, when you um, work on a, a big data pro project, um, you, your first job is to uh, validate the data that comes in and uh, write it uh, on disk in a suitable format. And the, the, the go-to solution when you're uh, programming in Scala is to uh, write a case class for each data structure and let the compiler uh, work, for work for you and infer uh, a validator for that, that data. Right, you can use macros and, and stuff like that. But when, we, when you have uh, 10,000 data, data structures, it means that you will have to write 10,000 uh, case classes. And if you have only six months and only five developers, you cannot do that, right? So, um, uh, oh yeah, I, I forgot uh, 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 some requirements. Um, that are the consequences of the, the previous ones. Um, basically, our pipeline, uh, our validation and transformation pipeline, uh, will have to be uh, configured at runtime because we didn't want to uh, have uh, to write some new code in order to uh, accept a new data source, 
right? We, we wanted to have our pipeline running and just put some configuration files to uh, accept a new data source. And of course, uh, we had to manage a whole bunch of uh, input and output formats, like uh, JSON and CSV in inputs, and uh, Avro uh, and Parquet uh, in output. So we, we, we thought uh, about it uh, quite a lot, and we ended up with a solution that was uh, revolving around the notion of schema. Um, because the, the configuration file that we wanted to feed into our pipeline is indeed the schema of the new data source, right? And that schema would have to contain enough uh, metadata in order for us to uh, apply uh, privacy transformations. Okay, so far? Right. So schemas are uh, uh, a very cool idea. You can um, do pretty much many, many treatments uh, only based on a, on a schema. You can validate data uh, to, to make sure it, conf it complies to the schema. Uh, you can use a schema to generate uh, random test data that, are, that is compatible with that schema. And you can use a schema as a blueprint, blueprint to uh, translate data uh, to different formats. And if you look closely, uh, schemas are recursive. Inside the schema, you have a smaller schema, and so on and so forth. And basically, when you uh, process recursive structures like schemas, you are tempted to, uh, to write recursive functions. And now your problem begins. Because um, the compiler won't help you uh, in, in writing recursive functions. If you have a branch, say we have a function, a recursive function that returns an int. Uh, if you have a branch that simply returns an int, and another branch that uh, recursively called uh, the function itself, the compiler cannot tell apart these two branches. And it cannot say, say to you, hey, look, you didn't make that recursive call there, or because you should have. So the compiler cannot tell really what uh, is right and what is wrong when you, use, uh, when you write recursive functions. Of course, if you're uh, recursing too much, you, you will have stack overflows. But more importantly, uh, when you write a recursive function to traverse a recursive structure, uh, you are mixing two concerns. You are mixing the how to traverse your, your recursive structure with what you want to do with each component. And this le le it leads to a code that is not reusable. Each recursive function you want to write will have to embed the, the traversal of your structure. And so you are repeating yourself again and again. But hopefully, there is a, a better solution uh, that uh, is called recursion schemes. And this is what this talk is about. Uh, it's, it's been defined in this uh, very famous paper, Functional Programming with Banana Lenses, Envelopes, and Barbed Wire, from Eric Meyers and colleagues in 1991. And it does exactly what we, ne what we need. It decouples how you traverse uh, a, a recursive structure from what you want to do with each component. And it has a very good uh, Scala implementation in a library called Matryoshka. Yeah, uh, I know, uh, talking about Matryoshka in Ukraine is really cool. So I'm very happy to be there. And um, now I will briefly uh, explain you how recursion schemes work. And then I show you uh, how we used it, them to, to, to solve our problem. So. Schemes are uh, split in three families. First, there are folds that uh, take a recursive structure and destroy it to uh, make a simple, not recursive uh, result. Um, the, the, the simplest example is called kata, catamorphism, uh, from the Greek kata, that means destroying, like in catastrophe. Um, and we will see that again later, it works uh, from the bottom up. Let's 
forget that for the moment. Then we have unfolds that do the uh, that go the other way around. You take a non-recursive uh, value and it unfolds it into a, a, a recursive structure. And the simplest uh, unfold is called ana, anamorphism, from the Greek that means uh, going up. I have no good word like in catastrophe to, to give an example, but that's not a problem. And then finally you have refolds that combine an unfold and then a fold. So you start from a simple, simple value, it unfolds it to a recursive structure, and then fold it back into another simple value. Right. So to use uh, recursion schemes, uh, you need uh, three ingredients. One of them I is optional, but you, you need basically the, the, the three of them. First, you need a functor. Everyone knows what a functor is, right? Yeah? So in this special uh, context, it will be called the pattern functor. Then you need uh, a fixed point. Most of the time, you don't need fixed point for refolds. Uh, and I will I, I I'll show you wh what a fixed point is. It's merely um, a way to uh, please the compiler. And finally, and more importantly, you need uh, a co an algebra and perhaps a co-algebra, depending on the... You need algebra for folds, co-algebra for, for unfolds, and both for refolds. And this is the, the, the important thing. It's where you, you say what you want to do with each component of your structure. So once you have a, a pattern functor, each uh, treatment you will be performing on that structure is only a matter of uh, writing an algebra or a co-algebra. Okay. So, uh, first step, we need a pattern functor. So basically, if we, we were to uh, implement a binary tree, we would write something like that, right? A simple ADT called tree with two, two cases, uh, a, a node with two branches, which are recursive, because it, it contains trees again, and a leaf that only has uh, a label. So the first thing you do if you want to use recursion schemes on that structure is to transform that into a pattern functor. And it basically, uh, I it's basically done by replacing each uh, recursive reference to the tree type by a type parameter, like this. Right? Now we don't have tree inside of node, we have A. And of course, it's a functor, so you have to, to provide a functor instance, which is basically trivial. You just have to call the, 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 the function f on each branch of the, of the node, and that's it. All right? But then, when you've done that, uh, you've lost the ability to uh, have a single type that describes all the possible trees. Because now, the, the type of your tree depends on its depth, right? The first example has uh, a depth of two, and so its type is node of node of leaf of nothing, right? The other one has a depth of one, and its type is node of leaf, leaf of nothing, and the, th the third one has, uh, un is unbalanced, and its type is even more uh, strange. It's node of tree of something. It's it's not manageable. That's when you, you need uh, a fixed point type. A fixed point type is just uh, a trick to uh, cut the recursion at the type level. Uh, it might look a bit, uh, a bit strange, but a fix is the simplest uh, fixed point type. There are two, two others uh, or three, three others. Fixed point type, but the fix is the is the simp simplest one. It's parameterized by uh, a type constructor, f, and it only contains uh, a value called unfix that is an f of x of f. So you see the recursion uh, is there in unfix. You have f of fix of f. So let's try to rewrite our previous examples using fix. It's becoming a, a little bit more uh, cumbersome, but basically what you need is to wrap each layer 
inside a fix. And as a result, you get back a fix of tree F. So the type isn't dependent on the structure of the tree anymore. Okay? But that's basically only a trick. You I, it doesn't add value to, 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 the, to the whole code. Okay, so now the, the very uh, interesting and important point is algebras. It's not the same algebras as in the previous talk. Uh, it's in the literature, it's called F-algebras, right? But in uh, the Matryoshka library, they only call them uh, algebras and co-algebras. So it's the way you have to uh, define what you want to do with each layer of your uh, structure. So an, an algebra, it, uh, it's simply a function from f of a to a, and it collapses one layer at a time of your structure. And co-algebra, like everything in uh, category theory, when you add co before a name, you get a new thing that is the same thing with the arrows reversed. So a co-algebra is just a function from A to F of A, and it basically builds one layer of your uh, recursive structure. And, uh, and most of the time in the literature uh, and the group discussions about recursion schemes, the A type in this uh, setting is called the carrier of the algebra. All right, so now let's look at how it works in, in, in detail. So hylomorphism is the most basic uh, recursion, recursion scheme. It's a refold, so it combines a fold and an unfold. And every other uh, recursion scheme can be uh, defined in, in terms of hilo. Okay, so uh, at the bottom of the, the screen, I hope everyone can read, you have the, the, the definition of hilo, like uh, it is written in Matryoshka, almost. Um, and so we'll uh, get through uh, how it works. So suppose we have uh, uh, a value of type A, which is pictures at, uh, at this uh, little square, and you want to apply a hylomorphism on it. So the first thing you, you can do is to uh, call the co-algebra, right? And this uh, returns you an f of A. It has built one layer of your uh, structure. So now that you have an f of a, it's f being a functor, you can map over that f of a. And mapping is like picking one element inside your functor and applying a function on it. So the next thing you do, once you have picked one of the branches of uh, this f of a, oh, by the way, um, I take the tree pattern uh, as, as an example. So we have a binary tree here. Right? So next, you recursively call hilo on that A. In turns, that calls the co-algebra, which, which uh, produces an f of A. So now you can map over it. And mapping only calls hilo on, on this A. So you call the co-algebra, and it gives you an f of A. So, but la thi this, this time I decided this f was a leaf, so there is no a inside it. So when we call map over on it, the, the function we, we pass to map is never called, and it gives us back uh, immediately an f of b, because the function we've passed, which is not evaluated, but it returns a b, so basically when you map a function from a to b on a functor, you get, you get back an f of b. Everything uh, okay so far? Right? No? Okay. They, I will repeat myself. Um, so now we have an f of b. So we can, we can call the algebra on it, right? And the algebra only peels off one layer, so we get a b. And we've, we've finished, basically, for that branch. But we were still mapping uh, the... Uh, this... Oh, it doesn't work. Uh, this f of a above, so we still have one branch to explore. It is it contains an a, so we can cal call hilo on it. It calls the co-algebra, produces an f of a, but again this is a leaf, so uh, it's empty. 
So when we map over it, we immediately get back uh, an f of b. So we can call the algebra on it. That gives us a b. So now the, ho the, the both the branches of our uh, upper node contain b's. So this is basically an f of b, right? We have finished mapping a function from a to, a to b on it. So it's a, a, an f of b. We can call the algebra. It gives us a b. And so we just have to finish the next branch. Again, we call hilo on it. Call algebra f of b, f of a, sorry. But this is empty, so it's gives it gets uh, an f of b immediately. So we can call the algebra on it. Gives us a b. So now the root is indeed an f of b. We can call the algebra on it. And we are done. OK? So two, two points to, to, to notice there. Um, first, we never built the whole tree at a time. We only explored branch after branch, right? The whole tree was never in memory uh, completely. And second th thing to, to notice is that we called the co-algebra from the top to the bottom and the algebra from the bottom to the top. Okay? Right. So, um, now we are ready to, to talk about the real-life uh, examples of the, the, the usage of uh, recursion schemes. So back to our problem. Uh, we had a whole bunch of uh, formats for, um, for schemas. We had our uh, input schema, which, was, which is our custom uh, schema representation with the metadata for privacy and stuff like that. We have uh, Pocket for uh, writing large files uh, on disk. And we have Avro for producing records in uh, Kafka topics. So the first thing we did was to write a pattern functor. We call it schema f because we have a lot of imagination. Uh, and then we wrote a bunch of algebras and co-algebras that go from uh, the, the standard schemas to our schema f, right? Back and forth. And we we had for free uh, the conversion between uh, all these kinds of, of schemas. Because if you want, for example, to go from packet to Avro, all you have to do is to go from packet to schema F and then from schema F to Avro. Right? So it gives for free a whole bunch of transformations. So let's take a look at what uh, at the code. Uh, so I simplified it a bit, but you have the gist of it. Uh, schema F is a simple ADT. Uh, we have structs, we have uh, arrays, and we have a whole bunch of uh, simple types, integers, string, date, uh, and so on. Again, uh, writing a functor instance for that is pretty trivial. Uh, you only have to uh, map the values of uh, the fields in the, the case of structs, uh, apply F uh, to the element type of arrays, and so on and so forth. So next, we want to write our uh, algebras from our uh, normal schemas to our schema f. Again, it's fairly simple because only you, on you only have to care about one layer at a time. That is, when you are uh, writing an algebra like that, that goes from schema f to pocket, all you have to do is transform one layer of uh, a schema f. And basically, because the algebras have, are called from the bottom up, when your algebra is called, um, the A inside the, the F you get is already uh, a pocket schema, right? So everything has been taken care of, and you only have to, m to, to care about your current layer. So uh, in Spark, uh, the, the, the type for uh, pocket schemas is called data type. And here we, we see that uh, when we arrive to this case struct f of fields, fields is already a data type. So all you have to do is to build uh, a, a struct type, which is the pocket name, with these uh, small data types. Right? Uh, more precisely, fields is a map uh, uh, from string to data type, because it's how it was uh, defined Sorry, in the ADT. All right. 
So next, the other way around, the co-algebras. Uh, you want to uh, take uh, uh, Avro schema and build a schema F out of it. And again, you only have to uh, care about one layer at a time, and everything else will be taken care of uh, by the, the remaining of the, the, the recursion. So in Avro, you have this method uh, getType that tells you what kind of schema uh, you have. So if you have a record, you know that you want to build a structf. If you have an array, you know you want to build an rf. And it's just a, ma a matter of using the uh, Avro API. And again, here we build a structf of Avro schemas, right? That's really the, the power of the, th of the thing. You only have to care about one layer. So the, the code is not really interesting, but for example, uh, in the case of array, uh, you just have to build an array f of Avro schema, and you can get the uh, element type with Avro uh, dot get element type, right? So again, one layer at a time. It's really easy when you when you understand that. So next, uh, the the main point of all uh, technique uh, was to build uh, a validator for the incoming data. So we chose uh, the JTO validation uh, library, which was extracted from uh, the Play framework. I'm pretty sure most of you know, know about it. And this library defines a, a type rule that has two parameters, input and output. Uh, input can be uh, JSON, uh, CSV, and stuff like that. And usually, output is your business case class. But we did all that work to just not have business case classes. So we had to find uh, an output type. And we needed this type to be unique, because uh, otherwise, we wouldn't have been able to write algebras because we only have one A in our algebras. So we defined another pattern functor called data f, because we have really, really mu much imagination. And it's basically all th the same thing as the struct f, uh, in s but instead in the arrays, uh, you have a, a, a list of elements instead of having only the type of the element, right? And of course, you have simple types, structs, and so on. So um, to, to build a validator, again, you, you get a schema f, and you want to build a rule of uh, JSON to data f, or more precisely, to fix of data f, because, uh, again, you, you need to have a single type. So the fix point is important here. And again, I don't dive into the detail of, the, of that code, but basically, um, you just use uh, JTO to, to build uh, smaller uh, rules that you combine in uh, the array, the array uh, case or the in the struct uh, case, right? And again, you only uh, take care about one uh, layer at a time. So in this uh, struct f, in the case struct f fields, fields is indeed a map uh, from string to rule uh, JS value fix data f, right? So all you have to do is to combine these uh, map values inside a, a bigger rule that will uh, validate the whole struct. And you can do that easily because uh, in GT JTO rule as a applicative instance, so you can uh, easily combine multiple uh, validation rules into a, a, a bigger run. All right, is Everyone okay so far? Because that was the easy stuff. So I, I say easy because uh, once you, 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 you're in the mood of caring about only one layer at a time, it becomes fairly obvious what to, uh, you have to write. But it can become uh, less easy becom because sometimes you need to care about multiple layers or you have other, other problems. For example, uh, the first problem we, we faced is that you cannot write uh, an algebra from schema f to Avro schema. And that's because uh, the Avro library mandates that 
every record in a schema has a single name. But we have no uh, information in our schema F uh, that helps us to, to give a name to, to records. So are we screwed? Hopefully not. We have at least two, two possible solutions. One solution, which is the easiest, is to label each node of our schema F with its path. A path in a tree, a path is unique, so we can use the, this path uh, to as the name of our records, and we are okay. And the second solution, which is a little bit more uh, advanced, but more uh, suitable, is to um, maintain uh, some kind of registry of the schemas, you the records you already uh, built, and try to reuse those uh, so that you uh, ensure that each record has a unique name in your whole schema. So, uh, how much time do I have left? <laughs> oh, okay. So maybe I'll be uh, a, a, li a little quick. So the, the first solution is to um, label each node of our schema with its path. Right, so there is a, um, a utility in Matryoshka called MT that is uh, basically a pair with uh, 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 E, which is your environment, your label, and an F of A, which is th the node of your tree. And this MT has a functor instance and so on, so you can use it to uh, traverse your tree and label each. Uh, each node with uh, a, a value of some type E. So uh, it makes a fairly big type, MT of string, sch schema F and A, so we can uh, define an alias for that. We call it, we call it with path. And in order to uh, label each node of a tree with its path, you have to start from the top, right? Because paths are built from the from the top down. So you need a coalgebra because coalgebra applies top down. So you start with uh, some seed value, uh, a pair of string and fix of schema f. And you go down the tree and you build a, a, a properly labeled tree. So basically, when you uh, start your, your treatment, you, you pass an empty string as the, the seed with your, with your tree. And in the end, you will have uh, the whole tree uh, built with, uh, labeled wi with its path. And again, it's fairly simple. Uh, all you have to do is to push down. You, you, you will use the names of the fields in struct as components of the path. So all you have to do, uh, uh, specifically, is in the, the struct case, you have to take the path of each field and push it down to the, the lower uh, layers. So it's done here. Uh, you see, we take the fields and we map a function on it that will label uh, each, um, each uh, children with uh, their path. Right? We, we just add the, the name of the field at the end of the path, and that's okay. And so when we have uh, a label tree, uh, writing, uh, uh, transforming it, uh, collapsing it into an average schema becomes uh, fairly trivial. You only have to use that path uh, to name your records, like in uh, records of path here. Okay? Um, maybe I'll skip that, if I have only five minutes. Oh. Ah, 15 minutes, okay. I, I, I won't skip that. Uh, okay, so thi this is uh, 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 probably more interesting. So now we, we, we explore the, the second solution, where we want to keep a registry of the records we have built so far, and try to reuse those uh, in case we encounter uh, a record of the same structure, that is, same fields names and same types of the fields. So for that, uh, we use another kinds of algebras called the monadic algebras, 
uh, and in, in Matryoshka it's called Algebra M. And basically it's an algebra that instead of going from f of a to a, goes from f of a to m of a, right? Where m is a monad. Uh, to use that, you need uh, to provide uh, a traverse instance for your pattern functor. Uh, the functor is not enough, but that's a detail. So, uh, basically, we, we will use uh, uh, as a carrier of our algebra, the hay, we will use this uh, type called fingerprinted, which is uh, a schema, an average schema, uh, paired with um, uh, a fingerprint, a unique fingerprint that is computed by uh, the with the content of the schema, and our M will be uh, the state monad. With every everybody knows the the state monad. Nobody knows the state monad except this fellow. Okay, so uh, the state monad is a monad that um, helps you to manage states <laughs> in a purely functional way. So basically, uh, you can put a state, you can get the current state, and you can uh, thread all these uh, treatments uh, in a monadic way with map and flat map. Okay, Fa fairly, fairly simple. So here we will use uh, a state where the state is map of long to a schema. Okay, so we have to imagine we have uh, a, a magic function called fingerprinted. We pass it uh, the fields of a record and it will give us uh, a hash code, uh, a fingerprint, a unique fingerprint for, for that structure. And so now we want to return a state of uh, our registry and, uh, and uh, the computed schema. So all we have to do is to, when we process a struct, we just need to uh, get the current state of the registry, uh, try to find our fingerprint in it. If we find it, we reuse the schema we have recorded in the registry for that finger pr fingerprint. And if it doesn't exi exist, we return that new schema with along with this fingerprint. But before we put that new entry in our registry. So now we are gar guaranteed that uh, each schema only occurs once in the whole uh, schema we, we built. Each record only uh, occurs once in the schema we built. And as a bonus, uh, we have uh, found redundancy inside our big, uh, our big schema. For example, if we had in the in the big schema, if we had two small classes with uh, a name field that is a string and an edge field that is uh, an int, um, both classes were maybe different in the input code, but in our schema it will be the exact same uh, schema. So we gain uh, a little uh, a little room on, on memory. Okay. So finally, my uh, last example and the last step in our uh, pipeline is to write this uh, validated and transformed data into a proper uh, data format. So we, I said that earlier, uh, when you write on fi file, um, big file, you want to use Parquet. And when you produce uh, our Kafka records, you want to use Avro. So basically, it's all a matter of uh, transforming our data f into uh, Parquet or Avro. So in Parquet, which means in Spark, uh, you use the row type. And in Avro, you use a generic record. Um, I will not talk about the generic record part because it's fairly trivial, almost. But I I with the, the row uh, type, we have some uh, little difficulties. Um, we can nest rows inside rows. Spark allows it, and the packet format uh, manage that, so it's cool. Which it means that we will be able to write an algebra from data f to row. But the problem is that it's uh, not 
an homogene homogeneous uh, representation. You cannot wrap everything in a row, or else you will have tables that look a bit uh, weird. For example, if you have a table with only two columns, uh, the first one being an integer and the second one being a string, for example, you don't want to produce a row of row column one, row column two. You want to produce a row of column one, column two. So you need, if you want to, to write an algebra, you need a way to know that you have reached the bottom of the tree. And as I said, in an algebra, you only care about one layer, so you don't know where you are, you are in the tree. But there is a solution. There is another scheme, which is a fold, called uh, para, that uh, basically gives you, along with the result of the previous uh, execution, it gives you the part of the tree you've already destroyed. Okay, in, uh, in, in kata and uh, the, the classical algebra, all we have is the previous result. And now with para, we have the previous result and the previous thing we have destroyed. So to use para, you use yet another kind of uh, algebra called G algebra for genera generalized algebra. And instead of going from F of A to A, it goes from F of W of A to A and W being uh, most of the time a commonad. That is the dual of a, a monad. In the case of para, the, the, the W, the commonad, is a pair of uh, T, which is your tree, the, the part you've destroyed just before, and, of course, the, the result you are building. Okay? So now we are uh, able to write uh, a treatment that takes uh, a data f and produces a row with a correct structure. All we have to do is use the, the, the previous tree to ask it, were you a simple type or a complex type? If you were a simple type, it means that at the step before, I have wrapped you inside a row, but I shouldn't have. So all I have to do is to unwrap the, the, the row I've built uh, mistakenly and use that to build the bigger row. So in this code is the value dot get zero. It's just taking the first element of the row and, uh, and use it in the hand of the case to, roll to build uh, to, uh, uh, a bigger row. Okay, so this time we, we used the, the, the knowledge of the previous structure to know if we have to fix what we did before or not. Okay? All right. So I think I'm running out of time. Uh, I would have many, many more examples of uh, usage of recursion schemes to, to, to present. We, we did many crazy things, uh, but Maybe uh, maybe uh, another time, um, and I also have to uh, to tell you that I lied a little. Um, this is a, a real story that is real, really inspired by a real fact, and we have a mascot. At the this is my team, and we have a, a, a big mascot. But uh, actually, we we didn't start uh, from the beginning using recursion schemes. We uh, wrote the whole system in a directly uh, recursive function styles, which produce, uh, 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 produced a, a lot of pain. And after the fact, we refactored it with uh, recursion schemes. Um, you might probably feel like this little poor little cat right now, uh, because this can be uh, a little overwhelming I, I, it took me months uh, and many silly questions on the Matryoshka Gita uh, channel to uh, understand these, thing, these things and come up with uh, proper solutions. So that's pretty normal if you, if you feel, that feel like uh, this cat, but try it. Uh, go, go to the, 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 the Gita uh, of Matryoshka. People are very welcoming and, and helpful. And in no time, you will feel like this cat and you, you will become probably a, a better developer, if 
it's, it's possible. <laughs> I mean, you are all very good developers, but you, you, you can go even, even further. Okay, that's it for, for my talk. Thank you. <laughs> I think we have time for questions. Thanks again. I listened this second time, but still there are some other holes. Uh, I want to ask uh, regarding the schemas. You mentioned at least Fiverr that you are mapping by path or using a registry. But do you, uh, once you transform the data into like the server source, can you access the schema or is it just something that you lose from original? Yeah, you mean uh, do do we save the the schema f somewhere to to yeah the, the original one from a source I mean oh yeah we we we, we keep the orgi original ones yeah okay uh, and someone after transformation can still access the uh, column names or whatever I don't know from those hundred sources that you mentioned <laughs> oh yeah. Um, the representation uh, I showed is a simplified one. And in our schema F, we have a whole bunch of metadata that comes from the, the, the sources. So we, we, we keep track uh, of that. But basically, in the pipeline, uh, what we do when we start a, a Spark job, for example, is that we uh, fetch the, the schema. At the it's our custom uh, schema. It's written in JSON. We and we do uh, an isomorphism. We use the co-algebra from uh, input schema to schema f, and the algebra from schema f to uh, validation rule. And so, in one only one go, you you go from your uh, your JSON schema to validation rule, and then you can start your job and validate data. Okay. Thanks. Okay. I have one question uh, in this approach, uh, how you need uh, pass context uh, to down. For example, when you need to say what the ID of element which was failed. When, for example, you have uh, many elements uh, on which element have ID and uh, uh, the definition ruler was filed something uh, inside this element. Uh, how this can be handled? So you, you, you want to uh, attach an ID to each element of the tree? No, I guess that um, we have forest. Each forest, uh, each tree in forest have name. Okay. Yes. Uh, if we fail uh, somewhere, we won't know the name of the tree. Okay. Um, so uh, you remember the... the um, uh, uh, this one, yeah, uh, the algebra M, right, where you um, produce not an A but a, an F, a mem an M of A. Um, this algebra, uh, thi this M is a monad, so you you can use the monad to uh, stop the the treatment. For example, is if it's the either monad, you can uh, return I uh, a right of A when everything is correct, and a left of the name of the tree to say, ah, I failed and I was at this tree. Okay? What, what about schema evolutions? So do you have to change uh, schemas from old version to new version? Do you have such tasks, problems? Um, Okay, so uh, in, in the, the real project, we use uh, Kafka's uh, schema, schema registry. And, uh, and other schemas, they uh, manage uh, backward compatibility. So basically, we fall back, we, we, we delegate this work uh, to the other schemas. Uh, but 
if you don't have that, uh, you have indeed you need to to keep all versions of your schemas, and I think it should be possible to to write uh, uh, version uh, upgrade with recursion schemes, because you you can um, I I it becomes a, a, a fairly bit complicated, but you you can walk two threes in the same time and detect uh, differences and then act uh, on the dr differences you you detect. Uh, actually, in Matryoshka, there is a, a, a pattern. Uh, MT was a, was a pattern. And there is a pattern called diff that basically does that. Takes two trees of the same type, traverse both, and uh, extract the difference between the trees. So you can do version control with that, I guess. I have a question. Uh, how easy it it's uh, to debug and uh, test such a solution? Uh, good question. <laughs> uh, actually, it, it, it's not difficult to debug. It's difficult to get it in part. <laughs> First, uh, the, the, the real difficulty is to find the, the good scheme and the good algebras. Once you have that, it's really uh, difficult to, to, to mess up. But it's r it becomes really easy to test because all your algebras, which is what you want to test, are only a big pattern match. So it's really easy. It's a pure, fun pure function. So to test, it's really easy. To debug, it might be a little bit complicated, but you, you always can uh, wrap into say the r the writer monad to to log what you do what you are doing at each uh, each step but when you are a beginner with that e and, and like me it takes you a month to, to get into inside the, the mental model uh, it can be challenging because you you don't see uh, I in the beginning you have difficulty to see uh, in which order things are done and so you have to put uh, prints and so on, and it's a little bit difficult. But to test, it's really easy because it's pure, fu pure functions. Maybe a, a last one? Yeah. W what <laughs> is it required that? Uh, the recurs recursive structure of different schemes is the same. Uh, Wouldn't it be difficult to implement uh, conversion, for example, when you extract uh, something from very deep level of one scheme to, uh, I don't know, to upper level of uh, an another scheme? Or is it supposed that each scheme different uh, uh, preserves the same recur recursive st structure? Okay, the, the, the schemes are only a way to traverse a structure, right? Right, for, for so example, uh, if uh, I need, uh, in that particular scheme, I need uh, some value from, no, not the same level, but uh, several levels deeper or no upper from an another scheme. Okay, is, is it applicable? The, the, there are schemes, uh, if I remember correctly, that uh, give you the whole structure not the whole structure, but all the little bits of structure you have already seen inside uh, a coffee. So basically, you can uh, you you I it's called isto, and you have the whole history of what you saw at each step before. Para only shows you what you you've seen at the the step before, and uh, isto shows you the whole history. So you can use that, but you only see what you have already seen. You cannot see the, the, the future. And from a practical point of view, I is it this approach is useful for uh, such task, or I it will be just inconvenient? You, 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 you all, all you can do with a recursive function, uh, you can do with recursion schemes. Uh, and it has many advantages. Uh, in some very specific uh, cases, it's 
it takes a lot of time to find uh, the right scheme and the right uh, algebras and co-algebra. So maybe uh, if you're in a rush, uh, going like plain old uh, recursion is a better solution for you. But it's worth scratching your head and trying to find uh, the, the good uh, recursion scheme uh, approach. Thank you. Uh, thir there is also uh, another technique I, I didn't show, um, which is called uh, attribute grammar, if I remember correctly, and is basically basically you use uh, a catamorphism to build not a, a, a value but a function, and so you traversing your tree from the bottom up to build a function that will be called from the top down. And that might uh, help you solve this kind of problem where you have to see the past uh, uh, or see the future. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.